Where, uh, where do I even begin? Yakuza Like a Dragon is the film adaptation of H.P. Lovecraft's classic video game, Yakuza. It follows the eldritch abomination Kiryu Kazuma and is a cautionary tale of why nobody should mess with a hungry Japanese man. Oh, Kiryu hungry. As a movie, Like a Dragon is a confused mess and not all that good. At worst, it's just kinda boring, but at its best, it's Yakuza to a T. A lot of thought and care went into making this film. There are sparks of brilliance, even if they're few and far in between. This might be one of the best video game adaptations out there, but I, uh, I gotta admit, I was pretty disappointed upon finishing it. I had high expectations for Like a Dragon for one reason in particular, the film's director, Takeshi Miike. My experience with Yakuza is limited to Zero, Kiwami 1, and Kiwami 2. Like them a lot, but haven't had the time to sink my teeth into the other games quite yet. The series has a unique blend of goofy comedy meshed with serious drama that Takeshi Miike has captured brilliantly in previous works, namely in Yakuza Apocalypse, which I had made the mistake of watching before Like a Dragon. In every way save for the characters it follows, Yakuza Apocalypse is the perfect adaptation for these games. It's absurd and it revels in that fact, yet the subject matter is played completely straight. A lot of what Like a Dragon gets wrong, Apocalypse gets right, which leads to a unique set of circumstances. It gives a point of comparison to highlight why one thing failed, whereas the other succeeded. Helps explain what went wrong, as opposed to simply saying it sucked. Let's take the opening scene for Like a Dragon. We get some scenic shots of Kamarocho, a close-up of Kiryu, and then a bizarre exchange where someone dressed as Shinji, who isn't Shinji, is trying to buy something from a gas station. It's odd, awkward, and kind of boring. This isn't the tone you should set for a Yakuza adaptation. It should be silly like the following scene, have an air of suspense like Zero, Kiwami, and Kiwami 2, or be balls to the wall intense like the opening minutes of Apocalypse. This sets a mood. I have no idea what's going on and it's great. This does not. Like a Dragon has an identity crisis. Unlike Yakuza, it has no idea what it's trying to be. The games are all over the place in tone, yet they all come together nicely. It's one of the key features which makes the series stand out. This is something the film fails to capture. Throughout its runtime, we're introduced to several original characters who are all doing their own thing. You have a pair of knuckleheads trying to, poorly, rob a bank, the cops trying to arrest them, and a young couple in the midst of a crime spree. There are other side characters, but these are the ones with the most focus. At first, I thought the film was going to do something clever. Instead of watching the plot of Yakuza 1 unfold, we'd see a series of side stories play out where our main man Kiryu shows up to either save the day or instill an important life lesson into our cast. It would have been its own self-contained adventure that gives an audience a taste of what Yakuza is all about, and be a fun experience for those who know nothing about the series. The first half hour of Like a Dragon really sold this notion to me, since most of what we see starts as Kiryu is getting food for the stray dog, and continues while he's retrieving water. For those who've played the game, you know where in the main plot this is happening. That quest is about to end, and free roaming is going to open back up. Maybe that's why the quest got extended in Kiwami. It's just a subtle reference to Like a Dragon. Oh god, that's, that's terrifying. What we saw previously was set up for a side story, what occurs prior to Kiryu getting involved, thus providing us context for what's about to happen without exposition. Initially, I thought this was brilliant, that I'd be one of the few who legitimately liked, or at the very least respected this movie. However, that wouldn't quite come to pass. Once Majima shows up, my hopes were dashed completely. The film shifts into portraying the game's main plot without proper setup or explanation. Worse yet, all the different side stories continue to play out, but fail to impact the plot at large. None of these characters reconnect with Kiryu or interact with the setting in a meaningful way, excluding the ending, where it's silently asserted that crime never pays, that the characters would have gotten the money they wanted or needed if they remained patient, 
a lot of what we see on screen is completely disconnected from what should have been the film's main focus. Like a Dragon is all over the place. You can kinda gather what's happening, but you aren't entirely sure why. Yakuza Apocalypse has this in common, but it's better. Flipped. To put it simply, this movie is nuts. You'll have no idea at any given moment what the hell is happening, but you'll completely understand why it's occurring. It's utter nonsense, but it's focused. Everything you see has a point and comes back later. For example, let's take a look at the 9 minute mark in Like a Dragon. Much like the games themselves, Kiryu is suddenly attacked by thugs just out of the blue. As far as fights are concerned, this isn't all that great, but it isn't all that bad either. There's quite a bit of flair and a few nice touches calling back to the game. I bring this up because this degree of style doesn't rear its head again until the end. It isn't a consistent aspect to every fight thereafter. It feels like disconnected fan service, as opposed to something the film is built around. Bearing that in mind, let's take a look at what happens nine minutes into Yakuza Apocalypse. Yeah, I didn't know what to make of that at first either. Initially when I watched this, scenes like that, which are numerous, didn't make a lick of sense. Though I could kind of gather what was occurring, it was hard to process imagery like that. The film had raised quite a few questions. Namely, was the boss actually a vampire or something else entirely? However, on my second go around, I understood what it all meant. Yakuza Apocalypse is the story about a strain of vampirism which turns civilians into Yakuza upon being bitten. After the boss is killed by a buff weeb and a pretty extra priest, he bites our main character in turn, granting him his powers. Because he doesn't understand what's happening, our hero accidentally starts an outbreak which spirals out of control. This is the basis for our plot, and remains relevant until an hour or so into the film. Once you hear the words, stay foolish uttered by our cast, things go off the rails, and the intensity is ramped up to 11. Bringing this back to breaking people's feet with a wooden sandal, the reason that scene exists is to foreshadow the nature of the boss's vampirism. The basement is meant to recondition Yakuza back into civilians, beat out their violent tendencies, and transform them into productive members of society. This ties into one of the two main themes present throughout Yakuza Apocalypse. Believe it or not, this crazy little film has a lot to say, between bouts of gratuitous violence and battles with frogmen. Yakuza are, very literally, a disease throughout this movie. Time and again, it's stated they're like parasites, that without civilians, they have nothing. Contribute nothing. There's also some parallels made between criminals and cops who don't do their jobs or abuse their power. Can't speak too much beyond that other than it being mentioned. Don't live in Japan, so I'm not sure how apt the comparison is. Point being, the Yakuza strain of vampirism is more than just silly. There's a reason for its existence, which helps furthers the film's message and narrative both. Yakuza Apocalypse is focus. No time is wasted. Everything connects, and it feels like a cohesive vision from start to finish, instead of the rambling patchwork mess that is like a dragon. Thankfully, for the most part, Like a Dragon's story is just the first Yakuza game told badly. I know what's happening since I had already experienced it. To be frank, I didn't enjoy the series' first outing all that much when it came time to play it. Zero and Kiwami 2 were far more entertaining. However, I can respect what it gave birth to. The story had good moments, but it felt weak in comparison. Coming into Like a Dragon, I was hoping for a more concise take that focused on what I believed was the heart behind the first game's story, the relationship between Kiryu, Nishiki, Haruka, and Yumi, the drama surrounding their diverging paths following Dojima's death. As you may imagine, my hopes were, once again, dashed by Majima. In the games, Majima is by far my favorite character. Starting out with Zero really made me feel for the guy. I was far more invested in his story than in Kiryu's. Same holds true for Kiwami 1. Majima Everywhere was a great time, and I just liked encountering this violent goofball. So, in theory, like a dragon placing a ton of time on Majima would be a positive. And, for the most part, it is, since he's easily the best part of this film. However, he winds up taking Nishiki's spot as the main villain. 
In the games, Nishiki was more of a background element, which I felt was to the game's detriment. However, he had some sort of presence. His shadow loomed over everything that transpired. In Like a Dragon, he's almost entirely absent. He shows up at the end, and you barely know who he is, or even why he's important. The fight between Nishiki and Kiryu might be the best segment in the film, but it lacks any sort of dramatic weight. There's no setup. If Majima would have just been the main villain, I would have been fine, though he felt a bit out of character from my perspective. Apparently, he was based more off of how he is in the original as opposed to the remake, which was what I played. I could get behind almost everything he was doing, save for one exception. Majima beating his men for not getting involved in his fight with Kiryu just seemed incorrect. However, him getting back into position and resuming the fight as if nothing had happened was perfect. Majima is Majima. Every time he's on screen, the movie gets this energy which is almost infectious. If Like a Dragon made whatever the hell was going on in these instances the focus, it would have been a blast. Granted, the serious aspects of Yakuza would have probably been pushed to the wayside, but the overall viewing experience would have been fun instead of... confused. The firefight between a man who has never killed anyone in his life, and Kiryu push a guy into some bullets Kazuma, is ridiculous but enjoyable. It's unlike anything we've seen in Yakuza, or at least what I've seen, yet it has the same campy intensity which permeates much of the series. Majuma getting a beatdown via Tiger Drop while saying can't lose over and over again until he finally collapses was legitimately funny. For a while, the film had an actual identity. It's ridiculous, comedic, but the stakes are still very much real. Unfortunately, instead of veering off and doing its own thing, capitalizing on everything that has just happened, we get total whiplash and are introduced to characters we, as an audience, barely know. Granted, this is a problem with the game itself, since Jingu kinda comes out of nowhere, but it really stands out in Like a Dragon, since he appears only to be killed mere moments after his introduction. Constantly throughout this film, I find myself asking, but why though? Why are we spending so much time with this young couple? Why do we have to see a woman get her uterus shot out? When I put my mind to it, I can come up with an answer. It ties into the overarching theme that crime never pays. However, said theme doesn't really tie into anything else that's going on in Like a Dragon. It doesn't intersect with Kiryu's story, and could be removed without anything of value being lost. In fact, if it was removed, characters like Nishiki could have been properly developed. There are three directions Like a Dragon could have taken with its story, and it attempts to do them all. If it followed the game, it could have worked. If it did its own thing with Majima and Kiryu, it could have worked. If it was a collection of side stories, it could have worked. By attempting all three without any sort of thread binding them all together, the film just falls apart. It isn't bad, in fact at points it can be quite enjoyable. It has heart, but it's by no means good. It lacks a unifying vision. This cannot be said of Yakuza Apocalypse. If nothing else, this film has vision. We're in someone else's world, and man, is it an unforgettable one. Come an hour into the film, we get the first utterance of Stay Foolish. This is then followed up by the introduction of Kairu, the world's most infamous terrorist, which marks the moment the movie comes into its own. The first line of Yakuza Apocalypse is our main character stating that, to him, being a man means being a Yakuza. This is eventually followed by the reveal of our hero, Kagiyama, specifically his lack of tattoo, which the film takes time to point out, contrasting his bare back with that of the boss. Simply put, this little detail demonstrates that Kagiyama isn't necessarily what he perceives as a man, and though he doesn't realize it immediately, that's his strength. This notion is immediately reinforced by what happens next, that being the rape of a young woman at the hands of Yakuza. Once more, time is taken to point out the man's tattoo, or shown in no uncertain terms that what Kagiyama thinks makes someone a man is in fact quite the opposite. What makes the boss the boss is how he looks out for his community, lends a hand when someone needs it most. A man is someone who takes care of those around him, gives something back instead of simply taking. The boss is a man in spite of being a Yakuza. 
someone that can't exist without the hard work of ordinary people, not because he is one. When Kageyama is told to stay foolish, he's essentially told to stop overthinking things. The life he's living is nonsense and he should accept it for what it is. Those around him are nowhere near as smart as they think they are, as witnessed with the Yakuza boss whose brains are literally leaking out of her ears. If they were, they wouldn't be Yakuza. Life is only as complicated as you make it, even when you're suddenly turned into a vampire. The movie comes into its own and becomes completely absurd once Kageyama chooses to stay foolish. It puts the audience into the character's headspace by throwing one thing more ridiculous than the next up on screen. Nothing makes sense, but that's the point. You're meant to revel in the insanity and just have a good time. To become a man, you need to accept your inner child. Watch a Yakuza vampire and a frogman in a frogman suit beat the hell out of each other. Stay foolish and stop overthinking things. Grand ideals of honor, of duty, pale in comparison to just trying to do the right thing. Kageyama wasn't a man because he was Yakuza, he was a man because he tried to help all those around him. Every aspect of Yakuza Apocalypse is working together to convey this very simple point in the most entertaining way possible. It's campy and bonkers, far more intense than it seemingly should be, with stakes that are played completely straight. It shares a tone similar to the Yakuza series, and has the one thing which Like a Dragon lacked. Focus. It picked a lane and stayed there, no scene was wasted, and it all came together for a glorious finish. Deep down, I hope Takeshi Miike takes another crack at the series. With that said though, I've been Bufar1N1, tell me what you thought in the comments down below, I'll see all you guys next time, goodbye.